I want you to imagine that you're the proud parent of a healthy six-month-old baby boy. You're not surprised to find that when the cold and flu season arrive, your child has developed his first cold. Now, you recognize the symptoms well, the stuffy nose and the cough, but he hasn't developed a fever, so you're not worried. But as the days continue, you start noticing that your child gets worse. You notice that aside from the cough, he begins to wheeze, and he physically seems to be having difficulty breathing. So you do what any loving parent would do. You take your child to the nearest emergency room. Now, as you're talking to the doctor, you're shocked to find out your baby doesn't have the common cold. He doesn't even have the flu. But what he has is something much more deadly. He has a virus that's the number one cause of pediatric hospitalization in the world. Yet you've never heard about it. So you continue to doc talk to the doctor to find out more. And you realize that this virus is the, number one is the most common cause of death in children from 2 to 12 months of age in the world, aside from malaria. And so now you're scared. And you're wondering, doctor, what can you do? What can you do to protect my child? And he looks at you straight in the eyes and he says, I'm sorry, there's no vaccine. There isn't even an antiviral drug that I can give your child. The best thing that you could have done is bring him here to the hospital where we can provide supportive care. And because he's having difficulty breathing, we're going to put him on oxygen. Imagine the fear and the frustration to know that things are completely out of your control. This scenario happens to many families all across the world. This is respiratory syncytial virus. And sadly enough, RSV claims the lives of approximately 200,000 babies each year. 99% of those deaths actually occur in the developing world, where many families don't have access to hospitals and the supportive care that they need. And so I'm here today to talk to you guys about what our group is doing, because we're committed to making a positive impact on global human health in order to protect little lungs from RSV infection. Now, you may be wondering, why isn't there a vaccine against RSV? You see, this virus has been around since the 1950s. So that, that's around 70 years that it's been around. And well, I have to say, unfortunately, there was an attempt. But that attempt failed miserably. The year was 1966. And scientists wanted to create a vaccine against RSV. And they wanted to model that vaccine close to a very successful pediatric vaccine at the time. It was the polio virus vaccine. Now, when, what scientists did was they grew a whole bunch of virus up in their labs, and they inactivated that virus with formalin. So the virus was no longer infectious and able to cause disease, but it was an ideal vaccine candidate, and it protected many lives. But when they did this with RSV, things went horribly wrong. 80% of the children who received that vaccine ended up in the hospital. Two of them actually died. This had such a devastating impact on the RSV community that for the next 20 years, no one attempted to make another vaccine against RSV because nobody wanted to be associated with potentially being able to kill babies. Now, one good thing did come out of those 20 years. A company was able to create an antibody that is effective against RSV. The problem is that that antibody is extremely expensive and has to be given repeatedly in order to be effective. And so, because of the expense, this antibody was only approved to be given to the most vulnerable population, those children who were born prematurely or those children who have some sort of underlying condition, for example, a congenital heart defect. But if your baby is a previously healthy baby, he does not qualify for this life-saving treatment. And so as the years went by, scientists said, you know what, enough time has passed and we really need to get back on and try to create an effective vaccine. And that's where our lab comes in. You see, we knew that an effective vaccine has to be able to elicit something called a neutralizing antibody. And basically what that is, it's an antibody that recognizes the virus, it'll bind to it, and it'll stop it from being able to infect the cell. And we had an idea. We believed that the best targets for a neutralizing antibody would be the proteins on the surface of the virus. But more specifically, we had the idea that the best protein targets would be those that are essential for the proper function of the virus, so those responsible for the infectivity. And so we identified two candidates. One would be the attachment protein, or the G protein, and the other is the fusion protein, also known as the F protein. Now let me tell you a little bit about them since they're important for the talk. The pre-fusion protein is really interesting because this protein, although it is one protein, it has two different shapes. 
So the fusion protein starts off on the virus as a globular protein, known as the prefusion form. When that protein gets close enough to the cell, something happens. We don't fully understand it, but it undergoes a conformational change, and it changes its shape. Now it's elongated. It's known as the post-fusion form. But what's really cool about this is that this protein can insert itself into the cell it's going to infect and open up a pore. That pore is known as the fusion event because the virus is fusing with the cell, and now the virus can easily infect the cell. Now remember I said the virus needs to get close enough for this fusion event to happen, and that's where the attachment protein comes in. So as the name says, what it does is it attaches onto the cell that it's going to infect. But there's something really interesting. It's also known as the G protein because it's full of glycosylations. Glycosylations is just a really fancy word for sugars, and so this protein is covered in sugars. Now early on in the field, scientists studied this protein, and what they found out is that these, these sugars they act like a shield. And so when antibodies try to bind to the protein, they sometimes have difficulty. And so historically, they've said, you know what? This protein shouldn't be considered when you're designing a vaccine. It's not an important candidate. But the thing is, we weren't convinced with the data. There was a lot of conflicting data that came out at that time. And so we said, you know what? We want to study this for ourselves. And we asked the question, which one of these three proteins is the most important target for neutralizing antibodies? But we wanted to take this one step further, and we wanted to know, when babies come into the hospital and they're infected with RSV, do they have antibodies against any of these proteins? And if they do, do the babies that have greater concentrations of those antibodies, are they less sick than the babies who don't have them? So we're a molecular virology lab, and we've specialized in being able to produce and study the proteins and the virus. But what we didn't have were any of the patient samples. So we decided to collaborate with a wonderful team of clinician scientists over at Children's Hospital. And what's really great about them is that during the cold and flu season, they see children coming into Children's with RSV infection on a daily basis. And so what they did for us was actually really wonderful. When the babies came into the hospital, they first diagnosed the child and made sure they had RSV. Then they made sure that this child was a previously healthy child. And then they took a blood sample. But they also took into consideration several parameters of these babies when they came into the hospital. For example, is the baby having trouble breathing? Is the baby having so much difficulty breathing that he needs to be put on oxygen? Did that baby need to be hospitalized? And if so, for how long? And using these different parameters, they were able to categorize the babies into three different groups. There was the healthy control groups. These did not have any RSV. We had those children with mild disease and those patients with severe disease. All in all, we ended up with a cohort of approximately 80 children, and we focused specifically on those babies that were two years of age or younger, so from infants to young children, because that's the, really the target group for RSV. And then we compared and contrast antibody concentrations between them, and what we found was actually really exciting. We found that the number one target of neutralizing antibodies ended up being the prefusion protein. And those babies who had higher concentration of antibodies to that prefusion protein had milder disease than those who didn't. Next, we found the second most important target of neutralizing antibodies ended up being the G protein. And this really made us excited because historically, I want to remind you guys, a lot of people didn't think that this was an important target to be considered for vaccine design and development. But what we found was it is an important target of neutralizing antibodies. And those babies who have high concentrations of antibodies to the G protein have milder disease than those who don't. So then we looked at the post-fusion protein, so that elongated form of the fusion protein. And what we found was this was not an important target of neutralizing antibodies, and it did not correlate with disease severity. And so with this study, what we find is that the fusion protein is an essential target for neutralizing antibodies, but the shape of it is actually very important. And so the pre-fusion form is the ideal target for vaccine design and development. We also found that that G protein that had been historically considered not important is. And then we were able to find a clear association between the disease state of the child and antibody concentrations. And this further validated the vaccine approach which our lab wishes to take. You see, we want to create a live attenuated vaccine, which is great because for all intents and purposes, this vaccine would have on its surface the prefusion protein and the G protein, but it will contain mutations that will attenuate it so it'll make it safe and keep it from causing harm. 
We've even actually found a way to produce more of our vaccine when it's under production. And this is really important for us because we want to be able to produce as much vaccine as possible for as cheaply as possible to really make an impact and get it to the people who need it the most. I'm excited to say that we currently have one of our vaccine candidates in preclinical testing. This um, experiment actually just finished, but we're still uh, working on analyzing all the results. And our vaccine candidate was used to immunize rhesus macaque monkeys. And blood samples were taken during the duration of the experiment. And then these animals were challenged with live RSV. And what we're hoping to see is that these animals are really protected because of our vaccine. So I'm excited to see what happens. And lastly, what I want to say is my project is only one part of a much larger piece of this pie. There are many groups that are currently working with us to help design and create this vaccine. From our collaborators at Children's to our collaborators here at Ohio State, even at the University of South Florida, there are many different groups of people with many different specialities focusing on everything from how to attenuate the virus, how to perform the animal studies, to us doing all of the serology. Because I, I said in the beginning, we're committed to making a positive impact on global human health, and we're committed to helping protect little babies from RSV infection. Thank you.